preparing for this interview, because of your invention, I was able to find every article written about you and by you in about a second. I was able to book the plane and the rental car that brought me here very easily. But I also got several unsolicited links to pornography. I have to accept that someone in Mexico may have stolen my identity and now be using it. Is the latter a price absolutely worth paying for the former? That's an interesting question, but you ask it as though it's a yes-no answer, as though we could, well, our, our choice is to turn off the whole thing or turn on the whole thing and have all the good and the bad. And in fact, I feel that the web should be something which basically doesn't try to coerce people into doing, putting particular sorts of things on it, but it's an open, like a sheet of white paper. Uh, and I feel that we need to individually work on putting good things on it, finding ways to protect ourselves from accidentally finding the bad stuff. Uh, and the, at the end of the day, when the, a lot of the problems of bad information out there, things that you don't like, are problems of the, with humanity. This is humanity which is communicating over the web, just as it's communicating over so many other different media. You must reflect though on the law of unintended consequences though because it, it wasn't remotely ever your intention when you started on this that so much of the web would be given over to horrible terrible uh, pornographic images of various kinds. Do you ever have bad moments about that that it has unleashed that force in the well, world? Well I don't see that stuff so uh, But you know it's there though. So people tell me, you tell me, but when you talk about large amounts of it, the things which should seriously concern us for example are people using the web to get information about how to do illegal things, whether it's to make explosives, uh, to how to kill people, poison people, or whatever it is, or sites which encourage them to do bad things like hate crimes or sexual crimes or something like that. So there's a certain amount of danger that this tool can be used for bad purposes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, it's a very powerful tool. And you, you, think, you've never had a sleepless night over that? No, I haven't. I haven't had a sleepless night over it because I suppose I'm so much more surrounded by the good things that people are doing with it. There is one that some people find particularly troubling, which is terrorists putting executions on the web. Tapes which no mainstream organization would show are broadcast on the web. Some people would go further and say that they exist because of the web, that because there is a means to broadcast them, they are actually created in that way. That is an alarming one, isn't it? That's certainly, that's certainly horrible and alarming, yes. Now, some people think, and many people in America think this, that um, in the mainstream media, editing was censorship, that there were these people stopping the real information getting out there. The other argument is that the internet has led to this great, this great empire of lies, of unreliability. You simply don't know what the status of any of this information is. When you say there are a lot of lies out there, if you go randomly picking out pieces of paper in the street, or leafing through garbage at the, uh, at the garbage dump, what are the chances you'll find something reliable written on the paper that you find there? Uh, very small. So uh, and when you go onto the internet, if you really ram rummage around randomly, then how do you hope to find something of, any, of value? But when you use the web, you follow links. And you should keep bookmarks of the places where following links turns out to be a good idea. When you go to a site and it gives you pointers to places that you find are horrible or, or unreliable, then don't go there again. Looking into the future, something you're working on, the semantic web. W what is that? That's the data web, if you like. Imagine you're trying to find a, a flight and you're trying to find the cheapest one, or, uh, or hotels, for example. Now, the hotels all have websites, and, uh, but they're not all connected together. And when you go to the website, you can look up, as a, as a human being, you can go and look up all the uh, different rates. It's not always easy um, to find them. You have to browse, but um, when you get it, it's in, a, in the form of a little web page and you can write down the, uh, the, the rates and then you can compare, uh, compare them all. Now, supposing you just wanted to ask your computer, well, go to all the hotels in this area and make me a table of the rates. The computer would be very nice if the computer could just access them as a database and query them and say, all right, I want, for each type of room, I want you to give me the number of beds and the, uh, and the size and, the, and whether, it, whether it includes breakfast and, where, and how much it costs per night. And then 
the computer would actually be able to go out and help you make that decision. And that's what the semantic web is about, if you like. It's connecting together the applications by allowing them to see each other's data and use each other's data. Tim Berners-Lee, thank you very much. My pleasure.